So we'll hear from Anita Calloway and from Priya Vaughan. Anita will speak first. The session is called Rethinking Australiana, and we're going to encounter some, uh, I suppose, categories of objects that we've not yet uh, had presentations on, so it should um, further diversify the material that um, we've encountered over the course of the past two days. Uh, so Anita Calloway is the Nelson Mears Foundation lecturer uh, in Australian art at the University of Sydney in the Department of Art History. Uh, her research focuses on the role of non-elitist visual imagery in the cultural development of both peripheral and metropolitan societies. And we're going to hear about some of her research that I've been seeing for, for many years now. In her office, she has an example that uh, connects with what she's going to deliver today. And I've wanted to hear about it for a long time. And finally, my day has come. Finally, Anita is going to tell me all about it and that I will understand it more. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Anita to the podium. I'm going to be talking about radio broadcasts, so I'm hoping there's an Alan Jones cough button here. <laughs> no? Oh, okay. So, here we go. Now, all of us have our own particular turns of phrase, our own peculiar embellishments of our personal lexicon. No matter how we try, to reinvent ourselves throughout out our life, these words or phrases keep springing uninvited to our lips whenever we let down our guard and are thus dead giveaways to our childhood and upbringing. Now today I'll admit to one of these examples, the search for the golden boomerang. Now I often use this phrase, unconsciously, to characterise any activity of mine that is complicated, difficult, time-consuming, challenging, or almost impossible, yet worth attempting all the same. I might say describe my desperate attempts to undercover some archive material um, as a search for the golden boomerang. But although I've been using this phrase over and over, for a long time I had no memory of its origin. And indeed, I was even unaware that I used this phrase until it was pointed out by someone very close to me. Once I became conscious of and self-conscious about this phrase, I began to fear that it might not be innocent after all, but have unpleasant connotations instead. Because who knows what racist, sexist, ageist, sectarian pejoratives enter our childhood vocabulary without our consent or awareness. Now one day I came across this book at a second-hand bookstore. And maybe I'll pass it around. I They're very rare. And the mystery was solved. It's the Search for the Golden Boomerang book. It's a book published to accompany a children's radio serial. And as I picked it up, suddenly I was a small child again, allowed, if I'd been well behaved, and of course that was all the time, um, um, I, um, I was allowed to, to listen to the opening strains of Johann Strauss's Waldmeister Overture and a man's voice, that sort of high, pitched um, Australian voice of the early 20th century, announcing the search for the golden boomerang <laughs> and continuing in our last episode and so on. Now, I, that was not good for my voice. <laughs> I didn't really recover my memory of the content of the episodes I'd heard, but I remembered at least that the serial told of the adventures of two children who were best friends, an Aboriginal boy, Tokoni, and a white girl, Peggy. As a white child growing up in suburban Sydney, my first impressions of Indigenous Australians were formed by young Tokoni. Tokoni was so brave and enterprising that I rather envied Peggy having him as a friend. Okay, serious stuff begins now. The Search for the Golden Boomerang, a long, involved story of the quest by two children, an Indigenous boy, Tokoni, and a non-Indigenous girl, Peggy, to find the golden boomerang that will bring peace to the land was a long-running radio serial first produced back in 1941. It was broadcast over Sydney commercial radio station 2UW from the Columbia Studios at Homebush with copies simultaneously recorded onto acetate discs that were dispatched to stations across the country. <laughs> 
There were 1,444 episodes in all, half of which no longer exist with episodes 748 to 1444 held by the Australian Film and Sound Archive, but still on acetate discs, alas, and then un thus unavailable for research. As the extant episodes are from the later period, starting with episode 748, there's no oral evidence of what the first 700 episodes entailed. There are no surviving scripts, so there's no textual ep evidence either, apart from the stories appearing in these promotional storybooks published between 1941 and 1946. And um, I've managed to collect um, you know, the whole set of them, but I, they're somewhere in, in my garage at home under piles of stuff and I couldn't find them. I think the silverfish might be having a feast. Due to wartime restrictions, they were printed on poor quality paper with cheap cardboard covers, allowing only crude colour printing. Both books and broadcasts were produced by George Edwards. He was born Harold Parks in Adelaide in 1886 and had been into Alia a vaudevillian, appearing mainly as a soft shoe dancer and an impersonator. He was a cinema actor, and this is just one of the um, films that he appeared in in 1920 called Satan in Sydney. He was also a colourful racing identity and an advance man for a travelling theatrical company. By the early 1930s, Edwards was middle-aged and with his career in the doldrums. He and his third wife-to-be, Nell Sterling, um, 25 years younger than George, were performing as second stringers on the Sydney showboat by night, as well as singing and dancing in a department store window by day, selling silk stockings between numbers. Um, Neil apparently had very good legs. In 1933, he was offered the chance to produce an old melodrama for the commercial radio station 2GB. The payment offered was 75 pounds, a good sum at the time. However, it was intended to cover a cast of 12. On Nell's advice, Edwards played most of the parts himself, thereby pocketing seven salaries and becoming an overnight success as the man of a thousand voices. Sumner Locke Elliott remembers from the time he worked as a scriptwriter for Edwards that in his radio adaptation of Great Expectations, the final credits were announced thus. Miss Havisham was played by Miss Loris Bingham, Pip as a boy by Master Spencer Tweakle, and Estella by Miss Still. Miss Nell Sterling, and then there was a bit of a drum roll, and then the roles of Pip as a man, Magwitch, Mr. Jaggers, Mr. Pumblechook, Herbert Pocket, Compison, Joe Gadgery, uh, a dragoon, the judge, the innkeeper, and all other parts played by Mr. George Edwards. <laughs> so for the rest of the decade, George Edwards and Nell Sterling ran their production company as a sort of factory, churning out as many as 30 separate episodes of plays and serials a week by virtue of dispensing with rehearsals. In 1936, George and Nell produced a children's serial called David and Dawn in Fairyland, written by Edward's chief writer, Maurice Francis, and he's the third figure in these photographs. Um, and they wrote it for the commercial radio stations 2UW in Sydney and 3KZ in Melbourne, and it also went out to 26 other regional stations. The program's Sydney sponsor, Snow's Department Store, I don't suppose anyone remembers Snow's Department Store, I do, um, also sponsored an associated book as a marketing exercise. As a pre-war publication, this book was not subject to the restrictions that later spoiled the Golden Boomerang books. David and Dawn was printed on art paper, allowing much finer reproduction. But art paper, of course, is less sturdy and easily torn and bruised, so fewer of these books survive. The following year, that's 1937, there was a second serial and a second book, David and Dawn Under the Southern Cross. Sorry, didn't happen, there we go. In this second series, this, and in this second book, David and Dawn travel on a magic boomerang, owned by an Aboriginal boy, Tokoni. And this is the first appearance of Tokoni in George Edward's repertoire. He's introduced in the book, that is, because as I said, none of the David and Dawn radio episodes survive, and he's introduced as follows. A fat little black boy came running down the path. He was as black as coal, with teeth as white as snow. He smiled at everyone, was not a bit shy. Hello, he said, and David and Dawn said hello too, and asked him his name. <laughs> 
I am called Tacconi, said this happy little boy. I will be your friend and show you through the bush. So none of the David and Dawn episodes survive either as records or as scripts, although the books give a good idea of their content. And as well as the books, however, a David and Dawn comic supplement was published in Smith's Weekly for a year um, between July 1938 and July 1939, and a couple of um, frames from the comic strip. The books and comic strip were drawn by Hartmut Lamb. He was born in Estonia in 1912, arrived in Australia with his parents in 1929, and studied here at the then East Sydney Tech, and worked freelance as a commercial artist and illustrator. In the first episode of Lam's comic strip, Dawn describes Tacconi. It's the dearest black boy I've ever seen, cried Dawn. But Tacconi is not a boy, not in the way that David is a boy, because Tacconi is a black imp, a magical other, a cartoon caricature. However, in 1941, George Edwards presented Tacconi in altogether another guise, as a brave young hero, one of the Arenta people of Northern Australia, and as the main character in The Search for the Golden Boomerang, again for 2UW Sydney, and initially for 3XY in Melbourne, but later moved to 3KZ. So what had changed? Well, it was 1941, and for Australians, the focus of World War II had shifted from the European campaign against the Germans to the impending threat of Japanese invasion from the North. And indeed, as we now know, Darwin and other parts of Northern Australia were bombed by the Japanese in early 1942. So it was surely no coincidence that this children's serial portrayed the Arenta people sympathetically and portrayed a young Aborigine as hero. Excuse me. Early in 1941, a feature writer for the Australian Women's Weekly was sent to Darwin to report on the invasion preparations. Her article, headlined, With the Boys in the Front Line, at Darwin, Strenuous Battle Practice Amongst Gullies and Gum Trees of the Never Never, um, described how, quote, how thousands of former civil engineers, farmers, fishermen, clerks, labourers, businessmen, barristers, are rehearsing daily for the Battle of Darwin, if it should come. The article described the plans for coping with a hypothetical attack. Quote, when the warning of invasion came, all the fine camps that have been built would be deserted. Darwin's defenders would disappear into the bush. But the article made no direct reference to the Aboriginal population, but the accompanying photo spread we can see on, on, the, on, the, on the right um, uh, included um, this posed photograph of, uh, of an Australian soldier with fixed bayonet and an Aboriginal warrior with spear and spear thrower, and other photographs showing an Aboriginal man trying on a gas mask. So the intended point of these pictures is none too subtle, I think, that white and black happily joining together in fighting off the impending invasion. Well, it's quite cheeky, if not downright offensive, to have appropriated the Aboriginal people into this wartime propaganda. Previously, white Australians had chosen to ignore the Aboriginal people they had supplanted, complaining that Aboriginal culture was now worthless because it had been irrevocably corrupted through white contact. Now, suddenly, it suited white purpose to recognise the significance of the Aboriginal people of the Northern Territory, our allies in the coming battle, to quote the Women's Weekly, and to claim that the traditional culture of these particular Aborigines, as opposed to the indigenous people of the Southeast, was untainted and therefore authentic. Social customs, weaponry, body ornamentation, and decorative motifs were, of course, specific to these central and northern Aboriginal groups, but white commercialisation now promoted them as standing for the whole of Aboriginal Australia. A small part of this wartime marketing exercise was the board game Corroboree, and um, Mark will just sort of now pass this around, and again, please be careful, don't be tempted to play with it. Um, it was commissioned in 1943 by the Sydney publisher's John Sands from the artist Jesse McIntosh, in which the players negotiated their journey through the harsh Australian outback to reach the Corroboree celebrations, despite the opt sorry, the obstacles and distractions along the way. 
Corroboree introduced city children to a simplified and trivialised version of Aboriginal life that encroached on sacred secret issues and exaggerated its otherness. In fact, it encouraged non-Indigenous city children to become Aboriginal, to metaphorically don blackface for the course of the game. And these are some of the um, little incidents in the game itself. You can see details showing characteristic Aboriginal activities as they were described. Uh, and the accompanying rule booklet stressed that the game's information was authentic, being sourced from the anthropological work of Spencer and Gillen. And we can see uh, all sorts of things. Eventually, we arrive at the corroboree in the centre of the board game, but we, um, but we make fire and we grind axe heads and, um, and we, we engage in a tribal war and so on. Now, the game must have been quite engaging to the white children playing it back in 1943 because it must have seen, seemed a reliable source of information about the Aboriginal way of life as practised by so-called authentic Aborigines and not by the urbanised Aborigines they were far more likely to come across. The game certainly oversteps the mark, however, by its comic reference, because here we've got um, uh, pointing the bone, and if you land on that number, if the bone's pointed at you, you're out and you have to leave the game. Um, that this Aboriginal belief is treated here as a joke is revealed by the proximity uh, of pointing the bone, number 45, and Kookaburra laughs, number 43. Now, my second-hand copy of the Further Adventures of Tokoni has the following enigmatic line of text along the bottom of each page. It says, many of the incidents throughout this book are illustrated on pages 16a and 16b. Well, I didn't find this a very useful piece of information since there were no pages 16A and 16B in the copy I had. So I consulted other copies of the further adventures of Tacconi in public collections, but they all had the same problem. Until eventually I located a copy which had the missing 16A and 16B and found that it was a cardboard game inserted between pages 16 and 17. And here it is. Um, I don't have a copy. It's my object, but I don't have it. And the other board game passing around um, is my sort of substitute. The game was missing from all the previous copies I'd seen because, naturally enough, every child had immediately pulled the game from his or her copy. And good evidence for the game's attraction at the time for, for you know, how important this object was to them. Some of the details here are captured by headhunters, um, narrow being left to her doom is the dance of death, um, and so on. And Peggy prepares for initiation, return to eight and miss a turn, and so on. So you can see that the you can see the emphasis on what would appear weird and wonderful to city-bound youngsters, um, despite George Edwards in several strategic press releases stressing the authenticity of the search for the golden boomerang's portrayal of Aboriginal customs and traditions. So in all its guises, in the, in the books, um, in the radio broadcasts, and in the board game, um, the search for the golden boomerang failed in its claim for representational authenticity. But that was never its real agenda. Rather, its agenda was to forge an immediate, if temporary, bond between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians at a time of national threat. When the Golden Boomerang is discovered in the final episode of the radio serial after 13 years, the Orente people no longer have need of whitefellas' help or their interference. Although Nakunda, Takoni's father, says they're always welcome, Takoni leaves Peggy and her family and returns to his people for good. The episode, that is the whole series, ends, and um, I must be um, grateful to a former student um, who actually um, somehow or other had a copy of the, of the final audio version um, of this, which was up apparently online somewhere, but has since disappeared. Tacconi says, why look, Father, look, the rays of the sun coming through the trees and shining on that great rock. Do you see what shape they make on the rock? A boomerang. And Nakunda, his father says, a boomerang of sunlight. It is a sign sent by spirits of ancestors, a promise of peace and happiness. So this peace and happiness at last, and it took only 1,444 episodes. <laughs> but each of the books, and I don't know, what, um, you know how long each um, storyline took um, during the, the 
the original broadcast of this radio serial. But each of the books finished in a similar vein. For example, um, book two, The Further Adventures of Tacconi. Um, Tacconi's father held the boomerang aloft for all the tribe to see. Um, and The Search for the Golden Boomerang book, the first one that's being passed around, finishes, I'm hoping, um, if I've typed it out correctly, uh, Naraka, who's the, the villain, Naraka and his tribe have perished. The evils which they did will no longer trouble either the white people or the dark. There will be peace now, peace over the whole of the land. So you have this idea that, you know, peace is being gained and then being lost and being gained, you know, for decades. In the board game, however, the golden boomerang promises neither peace nor reconciliation. It promises nothing. It has no symbolic value, no apparent purpose, other than marking the end point of the, of the contest. So what exactly was the search for the golden boomerang? A potboiler soap opera that introduced white children to the Arenta people and their culture, albeit in a distorted and misguided way. It was a series of cheaply produced storybooks that unhappily fell between the two stools of childish fantasy and glib modernism. Yet significantly, Tacconi was the hero, equal partner with and certainly more resourceful than his fellow adventurer, Peggy. And it was a sensationalist board game which introduced implausible elements, Amazonian warriors, headhunters, dance of death, into what was to claim to be a faithful presentation of Aboriginal customs and traditions. Now, why would I, an art historian, a visual culturist, uh, concern myself with something as ethereal, as insubstantial as a radio serial? My interests have always involved ephemeral artworks such as stage scenery, tableau vivant, street decorations, art of only fleeting materiality. Unlike the one-dimensional talkback and music broadcasts of today, 20th century radio drama generated pictures in the listeners' imaginations producing a new kind of ultra-ephemeral will-o'-the-wisp visual imagery commonly referred to today as theatre of the mind. However, as Neil Vermer explains, the images conjured up by radio broadcasts for a communal audience were not homogenous, but a conglomeration of different, isolated experiences. These imaginings were as varied as the number of individual listeners and as adaptable too. However, the magic of these ethereal mind pictures was lost, or at least substantially diminished, once Hartmut Lamb had solidified his own mind pictures into the images in the Search for the Golden Boomerang books. And this is especially true, I would think, for the board game, where the rigidity of the imagery was shared and thus reinforced whenever two or three children played the game together and destroyed the peculiar intimacy of the broadcast. So rather than I think that um, the board game um, captures um, the, the message, if there was one, of the, of the, um, of the broadcasts, um, it actually distorts it, it ruins it. And I'm wondering, did the board game kill the radio star? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>